Hello. <laughs> Uh, welcome to Community Conversations. Um, I want to welcome you here. This is our uh, season finale, I guess we could call it, of our Wonders of the World series. But never fear, we will be back in the spring with a new series. The best way to keep an eye on that is to check out our website, which is lowercolumbia.edu slash conversations. We'll have that posted. But we don't have events during the winter quarter, and we don't have events after Thanksgiving. So don't come here next week. We will not be here, uh, but we will be back in the spring. So look for us in April. We'll be back in April. Um, for those of you who are in Humanities 106, remember that you've got this paper to do and then one more assignment, which is your final discussion on Canvas. So take a look at that. And if you have any questions, um, talk to me. And now I would like to welcome a return visitor uh, we have Natalie Tan, who teaches biology and environmental science here at Lower Columbia College and is fascinated by ecosystem connections and symbiosis. She studied forest ecology at the University of Michigan and enjoys oil painting, wildflower hikes, and raising goats. Please welcome Natalie Tan. Hello, everybody. So... I am excited to talk to you about the thing that I think is the most wondrous thing in the world, which are really, 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 really big trees. Um, and I have um, lived in the Northwest for a while. I've grown to know the trees that are here. I've grown to love the trees that are here and they are my friends. Um, so we've got silly pictures from me as a young kid um, playing in both Mount Rainier, I think that's Mount Rainier, and um, the Olympic National Park. Um, and this is Susan Creek over here, which I don't know that that is still around because um, there was a fire in that area and I need to go back and see if that specific location was touched or not. Um, but yes, these trees have a certain beauty to them and I think it is a beauty that is incredibly unique and different from a lot of the other forests in other parts of the world. These forests here are both in Michigan, and while there is certainly beauty to them, the quality of the light that comes through these trees in the summer is like this yellowish lime green color, and the, the leaves are always making noises like they're talking to you, whether they're um, you know healthy and happy and up in the trees and the wind is blowing them around, or whether you're crunching through them in the fall. It's not that this forest isn't beautiful, it's just different. Here's a, um, oops. Here's an Appalachian um, forest along the Appalachian Trail, misty. You can almost feel the moisture on your face in this photo. It was a very wet day. Um, and the west or the eastern side of North America actually has incredible diversity when it comes to their forest. They have one to 200 different species of woody trees and shrubs. That is a lot of friends to learn and know if you're gonna work in this type of an ecosystem. But there's something disappointingly short about these trees. And despite living and working um, in Eastern North American forests for a while, I really needed these ones. There's something special about these gigantic monsters that we have on the Northwest coast that truly is a wonder. So this resonates with me a lot. Barbara King Solver um, in Africa it is, was writing about how she needed the blessed emptiness of mind that comes from birdsong and dripping trees. And she needed to return to her forest and the friends that she knew in the Appalachian Mountains. And I feel like this and have felt like this whenever I am outside the Northwest. There's one of our giants with a five-year-old for scale. So today I wanna to talk to you guys about tall trees. Why do trees go tall? Where are the tallest trees in the world? What is so special about the Pacific Northwest? And then I'm gonna take you through our communities. Um, what gives our canopy com communities diversity? Um, what's so special about our underground communities, which are our, our mycorrhizae? Um, and what is it so neat about old age and old growth for us? Why do old trees truly matter and why, why we need to preserve them here in the Northwest? 
So big trees truly are a wonder. I think you can, you can think back if you've ever gotten to see a big tree or look here. And um, there is a certain amount of awe to them. We know that big trees can grow really tall when they have abundant resources, when they don't have a lot of stress, which the Northwest has a very mild climate. We don't have crazy, um, really cold winters. And so our trees can photosize, so photosynthesize throughout the winter, except for a few weeks here and there when it's too cold. Um, we don't have hurricanes and we don't have, you know, these tornadoes that, that destroy huge swaths of forest. Even if a tornado touches down, our topography is so varied that it won't do any major amount of damage. So stress here is minor um, and there's competition for light. So. Here are where the tallest trees live in the world. We've got tall trees in Tasmania and Australia, tall trees in Indonesia, and we've got tall trees along the western coast of the U.S. Now, I don't know anything about Australia and Indonesia, so we are going to ignore those completely. And you'll notice we've got the meters high they are. The western coast of the U.S. wins every award with the tallest of tallest of tallest trees. Now, some trees are bigger or fatter, or they have more overall biomass, but the west coast consistently wins when it comes to height. And there are some reasons why. Um, Oops, is this where I wanted to go? This thing's a little sticky, so. Um, so within the US, these orange counties that are highlighted are counties that house a championship tree, a tree that has been crowned the tallest slash widest, most board feet, most crown spread of its species. So every species in the US um, is listed under, this is, Let's go to this, so the AmericanForest.org website, and they keep this catalog of all of our champion trees. And so this can be fun to look for if you have a favorite tree. You can probably find it here and find where the biggest one lives. Um, and they are mapped out by county only. Many of these trees are protected trees. And so giving the exact coordinates and the exact location is not something that these guys do. They don't want people coming and molesting their trees, but they do want to record where these tall, 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 or wide trees are living. And so all of our biggest ones are on our west coast. Oop. We're gonna just use this. Okay. So the tallest trees that I'm gonna focus on today are redwoods, um, Douglas fir, and western red cedar. So these are not necessarily the largest because largest is sort of a multiplication of their diameter and their height. Um, but these are the tallest of tall trees that we know of in each of these species classes. So the tallest redwood tree is um, down in Northern California and it is 115 meters tall. Um, it is located on a pretty near a pretty popular hiking trail, but the exact location isn't published, again, to protect this tree. And it's actually a $5,000 fine if you go near it. So um, don't try to find it. Um, the tallest but dug fir is down in Oregon. It's called the Brummet fir. We have some record holders up in Washington state as well, but the actual tallest one is 326 feet tall and it is shrinking. Once a tree reaches a certain age, it has a tendency to get hit by lightning um, or have a drought year and have a hard time surviving that. And so after a few hundred years, it starts to shrink back. It'll still get bigger, it'll get wider, but it won't get quite as tall. And then our tallest Western red cedar, I almost found it for you guys, but a very, very cold and high stream prevented me from being able to take a picture up close of it. Um, this is someone else's picture. This is the tallest Western red cedar and it's up um, by Lake Quinault in the Olympic Peninsula. So it's 195 feet tall. Okay, here's how that 380 foot tall redwood tree, the tallest um, organism on the planet stacks up according to Big Ben, the Statue of Liberty, Taj Mahal and the White House. And if you were to put the, tall, uh, the longest um, animal on this list, a blue whale, that is only one, uh, 800 or 880, sorry, 80 feet long. You could put it from tail to snout there and it'd be, less than a quarter of the size of a redwood tree. So these are massive organisms. The only organism bigger than this is a fungus, but we can't see it and it doesn't grow against gravity. So it's not nearly as impressive, because, but it is, it really is. Um, 
The way that we find our tall trees today, many of our areas have been explored pretty heavily unless they're very difficult to get to, um, is through LIDAR. So if you take an aircraft, either a drone or airplane, and pulse lasers to the ground, those lasers are gonna, are gonna pick up on the tops of the trees and the ground. And so they can estimate the height of a forest. And the way that we have found many of our tallest trees now have been by doing LIDAR, um, through some of the more inaccessible locations and then going out on foot to confirm the height. Um, you can also use LIDAR. This picture up here is of a waterway. So you could map out the seabed or of, of, a, of a bay if you needed to have something for shipping channels or something like that. Um, but this is actually still how we measure height. So you measure height officially by using a tape drop. You need to be trained right, to climb trees. And um, so these folks here are measuring that brummet fir, and I told you it was dying back. And you can really see there's not a lot of vegetation on the top anymore, and this worries me. Um, so he's gonna climb as tall as he can and then drop a, a tape measure all the way to the ground, really long tape measure. So that's how we confirm the heights of our tallest trees. I am scared of heights. So this is how I confirm heights. You use a clinometer and some math. Um, so a clinometer gives you the angle between yourself and the ground. This is showing you how you could make it with just a straw and a protractor and something heavy to hold a string. Um, but you can also buy these things. Um, and that'll give you an angle between yourself and the top of whatever object you're looking at. And if you know your distance between yourself and the bottom of the object, right, you've got a triangle. You can solve for one of the sides of that triangle. Dust off your trigonometry knowledge. Um, we take height measurements and we have calculations that we use um, that utilize their diameter and height to estimate board feet of a tree or total volume of a tree if we're interested in seeing how much carbon this tree is storing away from the atmosphere. Um, and so the standard measurement is you find your 1.4 meters high mark, which if you are an average male, it is breast height, but I am a short female and it's my chin. And so you take a tape measure, put it around your tree, um, and you can figure out your diameter if you know the circumference. You can also, oops, sorry, use a specialized calibrated tape measure that already has your pi calculation in it for the diameter of a circle, and it will just tell you the diameter straight away. So with those calculations, if you're a forester, maybe you're interested in board feet. How, how much volume of wood can you get out of this tree? But if you're a climate scientist, you might be interested in how much carbon is this tree storing away from our atmosphere. And so these are two really important measurements that go into deciding is this tree the tallest, widest, biggest tree ever. Um, the actual widest tree in the world is called El Tule and it is located in Oaxaca. Um, this was taken more than 10 years ago, um, 46 feet in diameter. It is not the tallest tree, it's just the widest tree. It's a pretty spectacular tree. But in our temperate rainforests, we have a special mix of both really wide trees. We're talking between 10 and 20 feet in diameter, not 46, and really tall trees, things that are between 100 and 300 feet um, in our older growth forests. So here's some pictures of uh, red cedar, western red cedar and western hemlock. We've got our moss covered um, big leaf maple and Western red cedar ecosystems. And then in Northern California, we have our coastal redwood ecosystems, which are basically just redwood trees. You can count the number of tree species in any of these forests, generally on one hand, sometimes if you're lucky, two hands, but that's it. We're not talking 100 to 200 different species of trees. This is three to five dominant trees in any given forest in Western Washington and Oregon. But these are, the highest biomass of any forest ecosystem. So um, up in the Olympic Peninsula, we have several acres um, that are the absolute highest biomass in the world because they have very large trees that are very old, stacked very close together. There, that's the area on the planet where is, there is the most weight of life on the surface of the ground. So that's what highest biomass means. Okay.
So back to this concept, trees can grow tall when resources are abundant, stress is minor, and there's competition for light. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. Um, what do you think is the most important resource that stands out in the Pacific Northwest that is abundant? Rain, water, yay! Everybody did great. It is water. So we have both nine months of rain um, and we have snow melt in the summer. So when we combine those together, we have the capacity for our trees to not be water stressed. Back to third grade science, just to, as a refresher, the reason why we have so much water is because we're on the West Coast and the clouds that have um, evaporated, you know, water's evaporated off the ocean and gotten into clouds and those clouds are coming straight on land very low. And they need to lift a wee bit to get over the coastal range. And as they lift, they're dropping water. Um, and they need to lift a wee bit to get over the Cascade Range or in California to the Sierra Nevadas. And when that happens, they need to drop some water. So we have two strips right on the western slope of our coastal range and our cascade range that have a lot of rainfall. And those areas both have a large quantity of large trees. Okay. Now trees need water for this process called photosynthesis. So photosynthesis takes sunlight, takes water from their roots, um, and takes carbon dioxide that's readily accessible in the air and does some chemistry magic and makes glucose. Um, and it breathes out oxygen as a waste product. We love it, we use it, but for a tree, that's waste, they don't need it. That glucose gets made into these fancy starchy molecules. Some of them are things like cellulose or lignin, and these are strong, tough molecules that build up that trunk of that tree. So so in order to have a really tall trunk, you need to have a lot of excess glucose. And you're only going to have a lot of excess glucose if you have the first part of this equation, the thing before the arrow on the left side, covered. You'll have no problem as a tree getting carbon dioxide from the air no matter where you are, but you might have problems with water certain times of the year. But in the Northwest, that's generally not an issue. And so if they have abundant water, they can continue to make an excess of glucose and grow really, really tall. Um, so a redwood tree, something really big, or a very large Douglas fir tree can transpire or transport 300 gallons of water from its roots through its shoots and out into the atmosphere every single day. So this is a process that absolutely affects our weather and the trees around it. Trees provide a moist microclimate for themselves to live in, um, which is magic. Um, also, the xylem cells that are the dead wood cells in the center of the tree that are transporting the water from the roots to the shoots act like capillaries. So little tiny straws that suck water up them. And um, water is gonna move up the tree from the highest pressure area, which is the roots generally, to the lowest pressure area, which is generally um, the air. And so if that occurs according to physics, um, in a xylem cell that's pretty tiny, we could probably get water to form a column using capillary action, which is kind of adhesion and cohesion of water molecules to the sides of that straw or the xylem cells. We can probably get a column of water to rise two to three meters high, which is really only this high. So that's not really a tree. Um, but if we add in to our equations, both the pressure of water coming from the roots, the capillary action from that tiny little tube of cells that's gonna stretch all the way through the roots, all the, and to the shoots, and we add in the evaporation or transpiration pressure from the top, which is that there are little pores in the tops of our leaves where the water is coming out and it's evaporating, the biology, biology word here is transpiring. Um, and so when it does that process, that provides a low pressure zone right behind it, which sucks more water up. So the combination of capillary action, root pressure, and transpiration can actually support a column of water in a xylem cell up to 100 meters high. Does anybody see a problem with this? So for a very long time, we went, uh-oh, physics tells us we can only have trees that grow 100 meters high, but yet we have trees that grow more than 100 meters high. I just told you the redwood tree, the tallest one was 115 meters high, almost 116. The tallest Douglas fir, 200, or 326 feet or 99 meters. That's just about at that limit. 
But did you see this right here? The tallest Douglas fir that was cut that we have record of in 1897 was 466 feet tall. So we think right now that the Douglas fir tree was the tallest tree on earth. And the reason why um, we don't have these anymore is because our Douglas fir is located in mostly accessible areas where it was heavily logged and Northern California redwoods are more protected because they're less accessible. The topology is too difficult to access with large trucks. Um, we don't have major ports in that area. And so that's why Douglas fir was um, harvested at higher rates. So the, what'd you say? The tallest tree, this one that was 466 was in Whatcom County. So up in the Bellingham area in Washington state. So coastal has a lot of coastal influence there, which is important. Um, okay, so any thoughts as to how would a tree get water if water can only move up to 100 meters high, yet we have evidence that trees have historically grown a lot taller than 100 meters high and we have a few that are more than 100, yes. Can they absorb what in their leaves? Absorb it. What's it? Water, yay. How would, a, how would a tree absorb water through their leaves? Where's the water coming from? Rain, yeah. And what else is special? What, hun? Yeah, so you can absorb water from the outside. Where is that water going to come from most likely? In coastal areas like Northern California? Yeah? From what? From the ocean? Yes. So rain, the ocean, these are great. It's fog. So rain, ocean, close enough, right? Um, so in many areas where we have the tallest trees, we have a lot of days of fog, including in the summer. So in the summer, when there isn't precipitation that's regular, there's still moisture in the air. And so when the content of, a of moisture in the air is higher than the moisture content in the leaf, that water can move backwards through the system and move from the outside air into the leaf. And we did not know this until recently. Um, 2004 was the first paper that came out with this as an idea. So this was a mystery, how trees grew more than 100 meters high until 2004. So water can move downward in trees when they're in a wet enough environment. And I took this picture here. Many of these trees have been affected by lightning. And so they're, they've had dieback at the top, but this dieback can also be caused from a tree overgrowing that 100 meter mark and then having a dry summer and then dying back to the 100 meter mark. So that often happens. And with the Brummet fir at 326 feet, at each year it dies back a little bit more. So it used to be a good deal taller than this and it's been dying back. And the reason for that is because tree, older trees will outgrow this, but then they'll, they'll hit a drought year and, and they'll grow back to that 100 meter mark. Okay. All right, I wanna to talk to you guys about diversity. Um, so we have both above ground and below ground diversity in forests. And um, if you just look at a picture of a redwood forest above ground, I was counting in here earlier, I only found five species of recognizable plants plus a couple of moss and lichen. Those get you some extra credit points, right? But there's one species of tree, just a few shrubs and herbaceous plants. There's not a whole lot going on in terms of diversity when you're walking through a forest on foot, especially like this forest where there's 300 feet of shade above you. The real diversity here, though, lies in areas that you don't usually see. So um, our canopies and our large old growth forests, not just redwood, but also our cedar forests, our Douglas fir forest will grow these thick mats of what's called canopy soil. It's not a true soil, but it does have organic matter. It does have you know, decomposed um, things and it holds moisture. Um, so a lot of these mats are made up of layers upon layers of dead moss 
um, with a live layer on the outside. And these can hold salamanders. These are great habitat for all sorts of invertebrates. These um, hold all sorts of birds, red huckleberries, ferns, Whole trees can grow out of these canopy soil mats. So it's not unusual to see a cedar tree that has a mat of canopy soil like this. Um, so there's some just ferns growing out of that one, but you could see a, re a red huckleberry, maybe a little bit of salal, maybe a whole Western, red hem or Western hemlock tree growing out of that um, way up in the air. So this has a biology and an ecosystem of its own. Okay, and here are some critters that live in these mats. We've got um, our banana slugs, we've got flying squirrels, the giant Pacific salamander, got the uh, rough-skinned newt, um, northern spotted owl will live in this territory, and then, not to be forgotten, lichens. Lichens are an important part of the nitrogen cycling of our old growth forests, and they are spectacular, um, both at getting nutrients off of rocks, but also at getting um, nitrogen out of the air and into a form um, that they can use in their bodies. And then when they die, they drop to the forest floor and they take that, that nitrogen, um, put it back into the ecosystem. So nitrogen is also often a limiting nutrient, but lichen in our um, canopies kind of takes care of this for our old growth forests. I think the most spectacular diversity in our old growth forests is the underground diversity, the stuff that we don't get to see until it sends up its fruiting bodies and shows us a little bit of flair um, of what's going on underground. So in order to understand our underground communities, um, we need to understand this word called mutualism. This is an interaction between two different species. So totally different species that are not necessarily related at all, where both species benefit. They often evolve together. They're helping each other out. Sometimes one of them or both of them can't exist without the other. So these true mutualisms here, lichen is an example of that. This is a mutualism between a fungus and an algae, um, algae that generally grows in water, can do photosynthesis, fungus that can do all sorts of amazing um, chemistry, and you put the two together and we have a lichen. Pollinators perform important services for our plants, reproductive services in particular, and these are an example of mutualism. And mycorrhizae, which myco means fungus, and rhizae means root, so fungus roots, um, there's a picture of them there, um, perform an important service for plants, and plants perform an important service for them. So mycorrhizal fungus are a fungal to plant root mutualism where the plant gets nutrients from the fungus. The fungus is fantastic at proliferating through soil with tiny little threads, um, getting more nutrients and more, more uh, water for that plant. And the plant will then in turn um, give sugar to the fungus so that the fungus can grow faster. Here's a picture of mycelium, um, which are, it, it is a bunch of threads of hyphae. Um, and hyphae are the name of those individual threads of fungus and um, mycelium that have relationships with plants we call mycorrhizae. These are, this is a picture under the microscope of mycorrhizae. Here's another picture from a woodblock experiment of mycorrhizae growing onto um, a woodblock. And um, some of our first experiments that was able to understand better the ecology of a forest um, was done by Susan Samard. And she ended up calling uh, mycorrhizae the wood wide web because it forms this communication structure underground from one tree to the next. Now we knew since the late 1800s that mycorrhizae existed and we knew that they connected to trees. We didn't know what they did. She was able to show transfer of sugars from a paper birch to a Douglas fir. So this was groundbreaking research because this wasn't showing that Douglas fir was communicating with other Douglas fir and maybe sharing nutrients and resources um, throughout their specific community. This is showing interspecific um, nutrient flow that's using a fungus kind of as our telephone line or our highways. Um, so this, this was really important. 
And this got scientists thinking about altruism. So Darwin was actually particularly stumped about altruism at first. Altruism is this behavior of an organism that where they help or um, benefit another organism at the expense of their own survival or at the expense of their own time or resources. Um, Darwin didn't understand this, and he spent some time in his books talking about why would altruism exist if natural selection says that those who have the most offspring and survive the longest are going to get into the next gene pool. If you spend time and energy and resources helping others, then you're not helping yourself and you're not helping your own genes persist in our environment. So why would altruism exist? And this got scientists thinking about community. So we know now um, and we understand as humans that self-sacrifice within our own groups actually increases our overall survival rates as a population. Self-sacrifice, though, in a com ecological community beyond your own species can also help with mutualisms and help with your own eventual survival rates because of reciprocity. Um, because when you help others, they help you, community connection is enhanced. And even if you don't get the benefit from your personal actions, your relatives, your peers may get those benefits. And if everybody is acting with that type of goodwill, the entire community is enhanced. So here's a picture of that in action. Um, that black thing at the top is a root. This black and green thing here is a root and everything is blue is fungal hyphae. These are mycorrhizae that have coated the outside of two plant roots and are actually communicating between the two of them. They're forming a highway um, and, and they're sharing information. So Suzanne Samard went on to continue research. This is research that she did in 2015, where she showed that there are trees that often will perform the role of donor and other trees that often will prov provide the role of receiver in a community. And our donor trees often are highly illuminated. They're super tall, they're old, they're mature, they're established, they're well hooked up to their mycorrhizal connection underground. Um, they often have a lot of nutrients um, and they're big. And they have a tendency to shuttle their nutrients and resources towards the receivers that can be smaller, younger, shorter. So they maybe haven't pierced through the canopy layer. So they're not getting regular sunlight. Um, and maybe they're in a, a nutrient depleted area or there's a lot of drought in their area. And that these nutrients can go from one end of the forest to the other. They're not limited to just your neighbor trees. These networks are fully enmeshed through the entirety of the forest. These are true highways underground. Um, molecules that are transported can be things like your plant nutrients, phosphorus, nitrogen, um, et cetera. We can also transport things like uh, water and sugars. Those are really common, but also chemicals like herbicides. So a black walnut might produce um, an, an allelo chemical or something that is basically deadly to everything in its vicinity. And that deadly chemical can transmit through those mycorrhizal networks and alert other trees um, or even help other trees with pests and infestations. So they will help each other out by sharing some of their poisons that they like to make to get those um, pests down in their entire community. Um, defense signals can also be um, transmitted. So these are things like little help, help, you know, there's, there's caterpillars, make your own hormones that'll, that'll get rid of this or, oh, there's a thing that's going on. So they're, they're sending little messages back and forth to help each other out. So this is something I think as humans that we can understand, um, but we communicate with other humans. We don't communicate necessarily with a wide variety of different species. And in forests, this is absolutely interconnected through multiple different species. So fungi are very smart. Mycorrhizae are not um, lacking in intelligence. What intelligence means and what cognition means for a fungus, I don't really know. But here's something that a fungus can do. So up top, do you see that period one thing? There is a big wood block and a small wood block. Fungus, mycorrhizal fungus specifically, was inoculated onto the big wood block and stuck down into clean soil. And then a small wood block was placed above it. And as that fungus proliferated out, they grew their hyphae out, they noticed the small wood block, right? The researcher took the big wood block 
and cut all the hyphae off of it, except for the stuff that was just on the surface of the block. And then they stuck it in that same one in period two, right in the center of a clean plate of soil without what they called the small bait block. And this is what happened. The hyphae proliferated mostly in one direction more than in the other. They have directional memory and they're foraging to go find that bait block again, except for it's not there. Okay. So do we understand cognition? Do we understand intelligence? Do we understand memory in fungal terms to be able to describe this? No, but something here is happening. Okay. So here's what we know about mycorrhizal fungus. It's incomplete, but we know that land plants have been around for somewhere between 400 and 500 million years. And fungus on land interacting with the roots of plants have also been around for about 400 to 500 million years. So land, uh, plants coming out of the ocean onto land probably coincided and happened at the same time that fungus did. 90% of our land plants have mycorrhizae. So these are important um, fungal associates of plants and they're important somehow for survival. We know that mycorrhizae can exchange nutrients and sugars from one plant to the other. We have clear experiments that show them doing that. Um, we know that mycorrhizae can exchange signals and chemicals from one plant to the other in a different and faster way than we might expect from airborne chemicals, which also um, do, uh, does exist in plants. We also know um, that fungus, mycorrhizal fungus, can send out signals into the um, soil that can help to manipulate plant roots to grow towards them. And plants can also send signals into the soil that can help manipulate fungus into growing towards them. So the, there's intention here, whether it's a human type of intention or not. And we know that they have what we call directional memory. Again, what this means in terms of their awareness of this, um, would we, we don't speak in biology in terms of what a fungus has awareness of because we don't understand where does awareness come from? Where does cognition come from? We don't really have answers for that in psychology. So we don't assign that to plants and fungus, um, but there is definitely something going on here. Okay, here's some pictures. Um, so this is same types of pictures as before. These are, um, the green here is plant material, so plant roots, and the blue lines, those are fungal hyphae. So these are mycorrhizae. Um, so uh, the way that we pulling up seedlings. So this is me planting some seedlings. I'll later pull them up um, and then prepare each of the roots to take little fragments of those roots and put them in a little uh, perforated basket that I can label with what tree it is. Um, and then they end up getting cooked in acid and India ink to dye the fungus uh, blue color. So this is a root tip of a plant and you can see the greenish part is the root and then it is fully coated by mycorrhizal fungus along the outside of it. So the root is not coming into contact with the soil. The mycorrhizal fungus is cradling and protecting it um, in a pretty extreme way on this root tip. This is a less protected root. Um, the the blackish, yellowy, green part is the root. And then those um, strings coming off of it in blue are the fungal hyphae. Here's probably a better picture where you can see both the root, the fungal hyphae growing on top of it, but also penetrating inside those cells. So this is a, a really true symbiosis here. They are living right next to each other and in each other. All right. So finally, I would like to talk to you all about old age, why old age matters in forests, why it's important. Um, so the first thing is something that we call the mother tree hypothesis. So this is I the idea that especially in forests like this where it's so dark, plants rely on light to do photosynthesis. They need to be able to grow tall enough to pierce through that canopy layer um, so they can get light themselves. And if they aren't getting light, they won't be able to grow tall enough to compete with their neighbors to ever get light. So 
um, mother trees, large trees in any given area have a tendency to shuttle a good chunk of their extra nutrients, especially their extra sugars to the small trees in their vicinity that are often their actual daughters. Um, because seeds don't often fall very far from their moms. Um, so this is aptly named and, um, it's a, it's a cool idea that the, the larger trees help to support those younger trees until they can reach sunlight. So even once a tree dies, its usefulness doesn't stop. So snags, standing, dead uh, trees in a forest also contribute to a healthy ecosystem. They can house owls and bats and squirrels, raccoons, woodpeckers. They can house insects that are food sources for any of these animals. Um, and often we're looking for snags as a sign that our ecosystem is healthy in an old growth forest. Another thing is nurse logs. So once that tree falls down, it's still going to be able to hold water. It has a source of nutrients. And so seedlings that land on top of it are going to be more successful and more protected. Also, there are plant chemicals in that wood that prevent pests that attack those trees. And so the seedlings can be especially protected on that area because of the tannins that are still there in the wood, even though it's dead. So we've got hemlock here growing on top of this probably cedar, um, and there's more hemlock there growing down. Later on, you'll see these trees will, the nurse logs will decompose fully, and then you'll just see a tree with the roots um, above the ground that you can actually walk into and through, which is really quite cool. Another sign that a nurse log has nursed a forest um, is this straight line of trees here. I mean, certainly sometimes humans plant a straight line of trees, but this very clearly was a log that many seedlings took root on. Um, and then now have the log is almost fully decomposed and those seedlings are all in a line. Hi. So... I'm sure you've seen this before um, and maybe even had fun counting how old a tree is by counting how many rings it has. Those rings are the difference between its summer growth and its winter growth. Um, the, the harder lines there are the winter growth where life is more difficult. Um, so each year is gonna create a new ring. You're counting the number of winters that tree has gone through. Now the younger rings are gonna be thicker. I don't know if you can see here, but these younger rings are thicker and then the older rings are way thinner. There's probably 10 to 20 years right here in the very edge. Um, so for a long time, because humans and math, practicality and math, our brains don't always bring math into everyday life, we thought that young trees grew faster than old trees. But here's the thing. This is a two-dimensional image, or this is kind of a, a two-dimensional um, idea of a three-dimensional tree. Right. So what we need to think about is the fact that the young tree grew whatever half centimeter it is times its overall height and the old tree grew that teeny little millimeter or less. But we need to multiply that by the entire height of that tree. So for a very long time, we had this misconception in forestry that young trees needed to be harvested early because that was how we got the most bang for our buck with our ecosystems. We need to grow our trees, cut them down after 20 to 40 years, um, and then we'd get the most wood. But older trees grow faster than younger trees when it comes to the amount of volume of wood they add per year. Um, so that has a meaning for forestry. What I'm more concerned about is the meaning that that has for climate change. So that means that old trees take more carbon out of the atmosphere. They do photosynthesis more. Their rate of photosynthesis is slower because they're older and they have a slower metabolism. They work kind of like us. But since they're monsters, right, since they're so huge, even when they have a slower rate of photosynthesis, they're still overall for that in one individual doing more photosynthesis than a smaller individual. They're putting on more volume of wood every single year, which means they're protecting us against climate change more than our smaller forests are. 
So there is value in keeping big forests in place. Um, and there is value in if we need two by fours, if we need toilet paper, if we need paper, um, having um, forests that have smaller rotations of ages, um, but definitely keeping old growth forests in place has value because they are a carbon sink that can protect us against climate change. Okay. So many papers have come out more recently about this, that old trees are global climate change sinks, um, global carbon sinks. They are um, fantastic, way better than younger trees um, when it comes to having more diversity both above ground and below ground. Um, they have more structural diversity. Um, they have more connections with their neighbors. Um, they produce more seeds per um, acre. So there are a lot of benefits to having old trees. And there are also human health benefits here because we have a lot of undescribed species in our old growth forests. We don't fully understand them because a lot of that diversity happens really high up or really low down. Um, places that we don't see, sometimes it's even microscopic. Many times we're finding new cures for human diseases in these locations. Um, so that is one other value of having old growth forests. Um, and there's also a human health value that when we enter old growth forests, we feel different than when we enter a younger forest. It means more for our mental health and for our spiritual health to be in old growth forests. And there is value just in that. So, in 1620, we had a bunch of forests and it's there in black. Um, we got really into logging and really into growing and getting bigger and bigger. Um, so by 1850, we had this amount in the middle of this graph of forests left. And by 1926, we only had 5% of our original primary forests left. So of those those 5% of our original primary forests, many of them are protected. Um, and, and when there's a question about protecting a primary forest, I think at least the answer should be, we should do that. Um, the cool thing though, is that I haven't shown you what's happened in the 100 years since 1926, and that is that we started to rebound. We consider a forest old growth once it reaches the 100 year mark. So we have a lot of forests that are graduating into old growth and we have a lot of growth right now. But primary forests are those that have never been cut and they have a special value um, and way more biodiversity than some of the younger old growth forests that are coming up to maturity today. So here is a picture of a cedar tree that's particularly old. And one of my favorite quotes from Barbara King Solver, solitude is a human presumption. Every quiet step is thunder to beat a life underfoot, a tug of impalpable thread on the web, pulling mate to mate, predator to prey, a beginning or an end. And I think this is a good reminder um, that if, if you are inspired after this talk to go look at some really big old trees um, to respect the soil underneath them. So this is my daughter when she was five, um, sitting on this um, railing and the railing is there to protect the roots from compression. Because when we compress those roots, we compress the air pores and the water pores in the soil that can hold air and water and that can support our underground microbial life, things like mycorrhizae. So not getting up close and molesting our large trees is important. However, in conservation ecology, we also understand the concept of what's called sacrificial trees, um, which are trees that are old and special. Sometimes this is a sacrificial nurse log that a, a, a trail has intentionally been made up close to this nurse log so that people explore it. Because we know that when people, especially children, climb on, explore, and potentially even destroy the natural world, they grow up into conservationist adults. They grow up into members of their community that extend that kindness and goodwill, just like trees do, to their neighbors. And so we do accept in conservation that sometimes there's going to be a tree. This tree is not going to grow into a nurse log. This tree is a playground, and that's okay. We need to let children explore, even in national parks. Here's a really great old tree that has survived a massive fire. It's burned out the whole center of that tree and it's still standing, it's still living. It can do all of its important stuff because the living part of the tree is just the inner bark, that's it. So a good three quarters of that inner bark is still standing and fine. And it supports a really tall tree. Um, and then of course, that value in when trees go down. So this was the largest 
cedar tree. Um, and it was, it was called the Big Cedar Tree, and it was located up on the north shore of Quinault. And now it is the largest cedar tree on the ground. Um, and it's growing new life. You can see some hemlock sprouting up from all the rubble um, when it fell to the ground in 2016. And then of course, we can use, we can measure trees or we can use trees to measure people. This is my eight-year-old in the back there from when she was born to just two weeks ago. We're measuring her with this Douglas fir and a hemlock tree in one of our favorite groves up in the Olympic Peninsula. This is a Douglas fir and a hemlock that have grown together. Hemlock loves to grow on other trees. All right, and that is what I have for you guys today. Here are some book recommendations. My apologies for them being so blurry. I also have some book recommendations down here if you wanted to just look at them. They're, don't walk away with them, but you can look around. All right. And if we have some questions, I'm coming around with the microphone. Thank you very much for doing this. It's quite interesting and a lot of information I didn't know. But I think when I was younger, it seemed to me like there was a tree, maybe it was in California, where it was so big and it was kind of open on the bottom that you could drive through. Yeah. Is that still around? Yes, it is. It Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Yeah. Is it California? Mm -hmm. I believe it's in Humboldt Redwood State Park. Oh, yeah. That, it's a drive-through tree. Yeah, I was quite impressed with that. Then also another thing, um, I noticed that in the Olympics that the trees there have a lot of um, moss on them. Is that damaging to trees or do they like that? So um, for a while, we called that a commensal organism, which is an organism that um, gets benefit. The moss gets benefit from the being on a higher ground on the trees because it gets more sunlight, uh, but it doesn't harm the trees. But we now know that, especially in the Olympics, where those moss mats get really big, sometimes the tree will grow roots into the moss mats and actually get some of the stored water because the moss will hold on to water for a lot longer. And so sometimes there'll be roots up in the air um, into those canopy soil mats with all of those moss. And so that ends up, be so it's a spectrum between what's called commensalism, it doesn't hurt the tree, and mutualism, the tree likes that. So. Do those question. systems uh, also include fruit trees as well? Say that or again? They those systems include fruit trees as well, or do they mostly just uh, go on for uh, like uh, nut bearing trees or trees that just sort of exist? So um, mycorrhizae, is that what you're talking about? Systems with mycorrhizae? So yeah. yes, many of our fruit trees, most of our fruit trees also have associations with fungus um, underground. Many of them are quite flexible and can handle many different species of fungus, maybe not as picky as some of our native trees. Yeah. Um, also with the fungus, would that be a symbiotic relationship with the trees? Absolutely. So what I was describing, mutualisms are a type of symbiosis. Okay. And that also be with the, um, like above uh, what you were talking about, um, like the ferns above in the trees, like higher up. Are the ferns a symbiotic organism? With no, trees? but like, I mean, like with the like dead boss and then. Yeah, 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 those. There are probably some organisms that are um, symbiotic there where they are totally, you know, dependent upon living on um, that tree. But there are others that are pretty flexible. You know, red huckleberry, for example, it'll live on the tree or it'll live on the ground. It doesn't, it'll, it'll take soil wherever it, wherever it comes from. Okay. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned that the, the fungus are helping the trees communicate. Do the donor trees help the fungus? Are they involved in this? Do they? So the donor trees will give sugar to um, the fungus and the fungus will use the sugar first and give the excess to the receiver tree. So, so how does that help the donor tree? It doesn't. So the donor tree is aptly named. It, it, the donor tree probably was helped in its early life. But now that it's older and more mature, it doesn't always get a lot of assistance. Now, the fungus may still harvest um, nutrients from nearby rock or, um, or nearby soil and give that those limiting nutrients to the tree. Um, so sometimes the donor trees still take from that system, um, but they'll often give more than they take. They'll give in sugar. Are they, are they aware of that? So that's...
are they doing things that purposefully aid it or are they trying to stop it from happening? Um, they are, there's generally, a, it's an aid-based system, but whether the fungus is taking or the tree is giving is really hard to put a finger on. So we don't know intention in the system. I wish we did. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering what they're doing up at Mount St. Helens. Are they just letting things grow back naturally or, or are they... That is absolutely the idea, Helping is that it is a fascinating thing to just watch what happens after a ma massive destruction event, how does the vegetation come back to the landscape? And so as much as possible, they are just letting that happen. Now, there are some invasive plants that are coming into that area that right now they're trying to make that decision of like, do we manage it? Do we not? How do we do, do with this in, in a way that's responsible? But yes, that was absolutely the intention when we set up that monument was to just let the land be and watch that cool process of vegetation occurring again. So are the trees starting to come back? Absolutely. The oh, trees okay. are starting to come back. And yeah. the micro, micro and the mycorrhizae are coming back. Yes. Oh, yep. Did the, did the, did the stuff affect them as much? Because they're underground so, or no. The Mount St. Helens blast affected just about yeah. everything up there. And so, yes. Did it totally decimate mycorrhizal fungus up there? No. Did it decrease the diversity? Did it decrease the abundance? I'm sure it did. I have not seen any studies on it, but I'm certain that if you put a lot of hot stuff on the top of soil, it's going to kill some of it. <laughs> that would be really cool to look into to see if someone has done that type of work up there. So is there any estimate about when it will recover? A couple mm -hmm. hundred years? Or? Time will solve anything. They don't, they Time will solve them. anything. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you very much to Natalie for sharing her knowledge here. And thank you all to coming, uh, for coming today. And uh, please join us again in the spring. But in the meantime, have a great Thanksgiving and take care, everybody. That's hard to read.